Well, we are once again covering another state, and today we found ourselves in the state of Maine. Maine has a lot of beautiful scenery, great lakes, great fishing, great lobster, but there's also some terrifying things going on around Maine, at least according to these viewers. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true horror stories from the state of Maine. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or at r slash thedarkswamp on Reddit. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Now, without further ado, be sure to backhand that like button, subscribe if you're new as it helps us grow, get ready for these creepy and downright strange horror stories from the great state of Maine. Route 26 Nightmare by Thomas M. Dear Swamp Dweller, The following story took place in July of 1994. I was about 16 years old and had just gotten my driver's license earlier that year. With that, I had a newfound freedom I had never experienced before, and I drove all over New Hampshire and Maine. One night, I was going home from a friend's house, he had moved with his family to the small town of Oxford, Maine. That night's weather was stormy, with lightning bolts and heavy rain. I was driving along Route 26 toward Gray, Maine, when I saw a woman standing in the middle of the road. She was wearing all white and seemed to be somewhat dazed. I stopped the truck and called out to her. Hey ma'am, you alright? You need a lift somewhere? She walked up to my passenger side and let herself in without so much as a whisper. Her clothes were torn, and she was soaking wet, unsurprising given the weather. I inquired about getting her the police or possibly a doctor. She turned slowly to me and said, I need to go home. My mother's waiting. I asked where she lived, and she told me that she lived in Porter, Maine. I smiled and said, You're in luck. Driving home to freedom, it's on my way. She produced the slightest hint of a smile and said the address. I put the truck in gear and started to drive home. As I was driving, I started to think of the address she had given me. I knew Porter fairly well and didn't remember a house on that particular road she had mentioned. However, I kept that to myself, thinking I was mistaken. The rain was coming down so hard that I was creeping along. We were only going about 15 miles per hour, and were probably just a few miles from Porter, and she hadn't said very much. I offered them a cigarette, and she accepted. I went to grab some, and suddenly she looked at me and said, Thank you for your kindness. I looked back at her and dropped the box on the truck floor. You're, you're very welcome, I said while picking up the bag and taking my eyes off the road just for a millisecond. I turned back to realize I was completely alone. I slammed the brakes and came to a screeching halt, sitting on the side of the dark road in shock. I lit up a smoke and calmed myself down. When I had regained my composure, I put the truck in drive and was about to drive off when I noticed something. The small bridge on the lonely back road I was on was gone. A massive tree had taken it out during the storm. I reported it on my CB radio on the emergency channel and they closed the road. Years later, I heard the ghost of Route 26 had been seen by many others and had on occasion diverted people from untimely tragedy. Regardless of what I saw or picked up, I must thank them for saving my life. Main Hunting Experience by Ben C. I had never been a massive believer in the supernatural, but I'm not close-minded either. I had never had an experience of my own. That is, until one night in early December of 2016. I was 16 years old at the time and was doing what I loved best, hunting with my father and grandfather. I have been an avid hunter since my dad bought me my first hunting license when I was 7 years old. Throughout my life, I have hunted all kinds of game, from pheasant to turkey, bears and foxes to deer and elk, so it's safe to say I'm fairly familiar with wildlife all over the United States. This particular encounter took place on my grandparents' property in southern Maine. They owned 55 acres of land with a small river running through the property's southwest corner. However, that river is a mud pit at this time of year. For a little more detail, the land's topography is very hilly with steep inclines and deep valleys. The plan for the evening hunt was supposed to be a short one and was only supposed to take two to three hours. 
My dad and grandpa were supposed to come from opposite sides of the valley, and I would come down the hill, and we would all meet at the halfway point in the valley and walk out together. The valley was elementary to find, as it was an old logging road and well marked. The idea was to push deer to each other. We had a late start, so only two and a half hours or so of daylight left when I started my solo track into the valley. Before I started my hunt, I pulled out my phone and looked at the property map. I know I should be able to walk down the hill without much navigation, but I fear I'll take a wrong turn and get lost. What scares me the most is pissing off my grandpa for making him wait at the rendezvous point, so I looked at the map to be safe. The first part of the hunt started off without a hitch. I was making good time while stopping every once in a while to look for deer signs. So far there was nothing worth mentioning, but I was happy to be in the woods regardless. Things, however, became terrible quite quickly. As I mentioned, there wasn't much daylight left, so we considered that. Unfortunately, we didn't feel the storm that came in like a bat out of hell with no warning. In an instant, the sky became dark as night and the snow came down where seeing more than five feet in front of you was damn near impossible. I had enough and began to haul ass to the meeting point at the bottom of the hill. Once I finally reached the level ground, a wave of relief fell over me. I was cold and wet and wanted a shower. Then my heart sank. I was off the old logging road. I still needed to figure out where I was. Everything I knew about making out of situations like this tells me to stay calm and forget about everything. But I am everything but calm. I knew I was down the hill, so I had to hope that my dad or grandpa was somewhere close by. Not even thinking about scaring any nearby deer, I yell out, Dad! Grandpa! I took a momentary pause to listen for a response. All I heard was the wind blowing through the valley and the sound of snowfall. Then, I heard something I honestly cannot explain. I heard, Dad! Grandpa! Echoed back to me, but wrong. What the hell? Over here! I yelled back, only to have the same, Over here! Yell back to me. This time it was close. Really close. Whatever was echoing me was moving fast. To hell with this. I pulled out my phone to call my dad or figure out where I was. But of course, it was dead. The only thing I was sure of was that I did not want to be in those woods any longer. I figured that if I walked in one direction long enough, I would eventually end up at a house or a road. I must have been walking for close to a half an hour with no sign of anything but more woods. The whole way, I had an uneasy feeling. It was like something was there, but it was... It wasn't watching me. It was... It was stalking me. Every time I paused to get my bearings, I could hear the snow crunching under the footsteps. When I had finally had enough, I called out. Who's there? But there was nothing but the sound of footsteps circling me. Then I remembered them stopping. I was able to pinpoint where the steps stopped. It was dead ahead of me. I looked out into the woods and behind a large hemlock, I noticed something duck behind the tree. It was quick, so that I couldn't make out many details. But whatever it was, it was tall and skinny enough to hide behind a tree without being seen. By this point, I was determining my next move. I wasn't too afraid to move forward to the hemlock, and I had no interest in finding out whatever creature was hiding only a few feet away from me. I raised my rifle and pulled back the firing pin. I fired around into the tree, and almost instantly I heard the thing take off at warp speed. Thinking I got rid of this thing, I continued walking in the same direction. I thought if I could get to a road, my dad and grandpa would be looking for me. So I carried on, and so did the storm. After another hour or so, I finally stumbled onto a paved street with no other issues. I had to figure out how to contact my dad so they could pick me up. That is when I heard it again. Dad! Grandpa! The thing had still been stalking me. I fired another round into the air, but it had no effect. The creature kept yelling back at me, and it was getting closer and closer. Once it sounded almost on top of me, it went dead silent. I looked around and heard a welcoming sound. It was my dad's truck coming down the road. Thank God. I piled in and began to tell my dad and grandpa everything. When my dad started to drive off, I looked behind me and through the red glow of the taillight, I saw a tall figure duck behind another tree. I, to this day, have never figured out what was stalking me in those woods. If anyone has any idea to what I encountered, I'm all ears. A Not-So-Jolly Christmas by Anonymous I've been dreading sharing this story as the memories are hard to relive. 
My family and I were involved in a shooting. It was December 20th, 1993, in Berwick, Maine, where these events began. They lasted until about the 21st or 22nd, however. I was 14 when this happened, and my father was no longer really in my family's or my life. To give you an idea of the layout where we lived, before you walk into our apartment, you have to go into a room with a staircase that leads up. Our door is the last one on the right when you're facing the front entrance. When you first enter our apartment, you will start in the living room, followed by the kitchen. To the left is the bathroom, and through a doorway past the kitchen is my brother's room. Through my brother's room and another doorway is my room, while in the back of my room, to the left is the back exit of the apartment itself. Now that I've got this set up out of the way, I'll explain the story itself. It was Christmas break, and it had been snowing rather heavily. We had just finished having my brother's birthday party, and as such, there was my mom, three brothers, and myself, and our neighbor's son, whom we'll call Johnny. Johnny and I were the same age, went to the same school, and he had a crush on me. All the kids were in my brother's room working on a puzzle when I wanted to ask my mom a question. She was in the living room. I should also add there's a window above the kitchen sink which will be necessary. And I headed in before asking my mom something. I soon noticed a sound as I walked by the kitchen, but I ignored it. I soon head back to my brother's room when I hear the noise again. I turn to my mom and ask her if she also heard the noise. She confirmed and she had. And me being dumb and 14 years old at the time, I wanted to see if it happened again if I walked by the kitchen window. I walked by and again we heard the noise. Curious, I asked my mom what she thought the sound was. She told me it was probably just kids playing with some firecrackers. She asked me what I thought it was and I told her I had no clue. I then shrugged and kept going towards my brother's room, at which point I heard the firecracker sound off several more times. I turned back and asked my mom if she still thought it was firecrackers, as I thought it sounded more like a gun. She told me whoever was making the noise was going too far with it, and she had to go to her friends to use their phones to call the police. I was instructed to not open the door for anyone but her, but I knew it was her because she'd knocked twice to signal me. At this point, she locked the door behind her and headed to her friend's house. My brothers must have known something was wrong because they had been worried. They had looks on their face that really showed that they were kind of scared. I instructed them to crawl to the bathroom, and once I grabbed my one-year-old brother, I joined them, locking the door behind me. I figured things would be safer this way as there was only one tiny window that no adult would fit through, but if we needed to, we could. We stayed quiet and listened outside. It had only been about a minute when I heard several more popping sounds. My brothers began crying and I'll admit, although I kept a brave face, I was terrified. I, I couldn't shake that thought of my mom being out there and was worried that she could have been shot or worse. Worried about my mother, I handed my little brother to Johnny and said I'd check on my mom. I peeked through the windows of the kitchen and didn't see my mom, which led me to believe I might have overreacted about the entire situation. Just as I was about to calm down, I heard a knocking at the door, which made me jump. Johnny gave me a look as though asking what we should do, but I wasn't really sure what to do. The knocking continued, and, and I knew it wasn't my mom. Johnny came out and stood next to me, and another knock came at the door. Johnny finally asked who it was, at which point a deep male voice said, It's me. Johnny, unsure of who it was, asked him who the hell was me. The voice then said it was Kevin. I turned to Johnny and said it was okay, as Kevin was my stepdad. Johnny opened the door, and Kevin asked if we had heard the popping sounds. We said yes before Kevin told us to go with him to their place until my mom returned. We agreed, and just as I was about to leave, I saw my mom's friend Bear out in the street. Assuming that was okay, I told Johnny to go with my brothers and rushed to meet Bear. I asked Bear if he had seen my mom, and he had said she was on the phone with the police. I hugged Bear before standing slightly to his left, at which point I noticed he was eyeing a house near the garage. What happened next gave me absolute nightmares, and I still dream about it to this day. I heard the sound of a gun, and Bear grabbed my right arm. Then I heard another sound, and blood splattered on me. Bear told me to run as fast as possible as he fell to the ground screaming in pain. He'd been shot in the left cheek. I ran and busted through Johnny's door, crying, shaken, and hyperventilating. I'm asthmatic. As I fell to my knees crying, this is when I met Wendy, who would become my first best friend. She asked me who I was before I started screaming and telling her about my neighbor Bear getting shot in the face. Wendy hung up the phone she was on and her parents came into the room. Everything after this was a bit hazy on the account of me being in shock and traumatized from witnessing someone get shot in front of me. Wendy took me upstairs to change clothes and I was trying to say something, 
but I just couldn't get it out. My mom showed up at the neighbors before bringing us home, but I don't remember when or how. I remember my brother, whose birthday it was, throwing up in the toilet in our apartment. The paramedics tried to get us at one point, but they couldn't because the shooter was shooting everything that moved. I was rocking back and forth, staring into a mirror, shocked when I noticed a man in the mirror. The man looked to be in his 40s, somewhat heavyset, messy hair down to his ears, brown eyes, and appeared unshaven. We were in the bathroom for hours. I'm not sure how many, but the police kept calling, which is how my mom found out the ambulance couldn't get to us. I also heard they had reached Bear and he was alive but in critical condition. This calmed me somewhat because he was alive, but I was still afraid he might not make it. It was quite suddenly when the door was suddenly smashed in, terrifying all of us. It turned out to be SWAT. Although afraid, I began feeling safer, knowing it was all finally over. We all eventually snuck to my bedroom before the gunman started firing again. The police kept us safe, but again, we were pinned for hours. At some point, the sun came up. I had no concept of time at this point, as I was very shocked. Trauma makes everything feel like a dream. It's the best way I can describe it to anyone who has ever been in a situation where they are traumatized and it isn't something you can truly understand if you've never been in the case. It's a defense mechanism of the brain, but it can lead to PTSD among other things. My mind had checked out at this point and only snapped again when I watched a tree shatter when a bullet flew through it. Part of me didn't want to believe this and part of me pondered on how many guns the gunman had. My family was scared and I was as well though my mind wasn't fully processing it. I held my one-year-old brother, singing to him and reassuring him it'd be fine, and we wouldn't let anything happen to him. Eventually, my brother drifted off to sleep, and some time after, I'm not sure how long, the police told us they would be moving us to Town Hall, which was close to our apartment. The cops informed us to stick close to vehicles and them. They said to keep low and move. After some time, it was finally time to go. The movement we all had was in unison with the police. The gunmen soon opened fire on us. I remember the police firing back and the sound of bullets whizzing by from the police and the gunmen. I remember being terrified and numb all at once. At one point we got behind some vehicles and bullets ricocheted all around us. We heard one hit the top of a tire and pop it. As we approached Town Hall, I saw news reporters and people looking afraid all around us. I forgot about the blanket the police had put around me before leaving our home and tripped over it in the chaos. I didn't get up immediately and remember people freaking out, thinking I had been shot. The truth was I was embarrassed by tripping, and I'd hit my head pretty hard on the fall down. A police officer eventually picked me up and began running. We ultimately were cornered by the media, who talked to my mom and myself, and it was a little overwhelming but I remember feeling some semblance of safety again. We made it to the paramedics and I remember someone of some importance reassuring us we were safe. It could have been the mayor and he was dressed sharply enough to be one. Once we arrived at the SIP or the shelter in place, they had gym mats out and some pizza. After we attempted to play and try to make some normalcy out of the rest of the hours, we eventually settled down and tried to sleep. My sleep, of course, was not uninterrupted as I woke up any time I heard gunfire, but once the gunfire lessened and eventually stopped altogether, I felt an array of feelings and exhaustion overcame me. We were finally, truly safe. I cried myself to sleep until a nightmare woke me up when we all eventually went home again. There was a heaviness in the air when we finally returned to our apartment. We hadn't fully processed everything we went through yet. The apartment never really felt the same after that day. I remember being irrationally angry when I went back to my room. It was a mess, the door had been kicked off the hinges and never shut right after that. Even when it was fixed, it just never really closed. My curtains were destroyed and everything was trashed. I found out later that the police had used my room as a staging ground. Bear, thankfully, made a full recovery from his injuries. Well, the physical ones anyway. I found out years later that he was never the same after being shot in the face. And then again, I'm still not the same myself and I wasn't even shot. I don't blame Bear one bit for being messed up. Remember the man in the mirror I mentioned earlier? I described him to Wendy and she explained I had told the shooter to the finest of details. I don't recall seeing the shooter, but perhaps I did see him. The mind will do strange things while you're in shock. When the break was over and we returned to school, the kids kept asking us about what had happened. We couldn't deal with it and I went to the office and called my mom and left. The school told us to take as much time as we needed and we took a few months off. When the information eventually came out, it turned out that our neighbor across the street was the shooter. His name was Patrick Wood. He was ex-military and the police had thrown tear gas. Later on, they realized he hadn't left because he had a gas mask on. 
Inside his home, they found tons of weapons and ammunition. He had dug a tunnel from his house to his shed where his guns were, and he'd used that to restock and reload when he was entirely out of ammunition. The man also had several medications strewn all over the place. When I was with Bear, I heard a whirring sound on the first bullet. It turned out that that sound was the shot narrowly missing my head. I'm lucky to be alive to share this story with you today. Patrick was terminally ill with cancer and his wife left with their kids. I'd imagined that's why he did what he did. I passed no judgment on his wife. It's not her fault. He snapped, not her. I believed she had good reasons for leaving with their kids. I mean, look what he did. It's going to sound crazy, but please hear me out when I say I empathize with Patrick in a way. He had lost everything, and if I was placed in his shoes, while I probably wouldn't have done what he did, I do kind of see his perspective, even though it's completely terrible. Some part of me feels that if that guy wanted me dead, he wouldn't have missed that headshot. I don't... I don't know. I don't think he wanted me dead, but I can only speculate because obviously I'm here to live. It's only speculation and we'll never know as, you know, he was shot dead in the end. Patrick was amazingly the only person to die during the shooting. I guess I do feel bad he died in the end, but since these... But since these traumatic events, I never feel safe anywhere. Any loud popping or sudden sound makes me panic, and sometimes I'll get cold sweats and start hyperventilating just from being around too many people. I've had several years of therapy, but it's never going to be wholly solved. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright terrifying and traumatic horror stories from the great state of Maine. I'll tell you what, I did not expect that last story to be so filled with drama, trauma, and downright terrifying moments. I don't know what I would do if I was ever caught in a mass shooting. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, please be sure to punch that like button in the face so you break its nose. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you're new as it helps me grow. If you're listening to this show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, please give us a five-star rating over there as it helps me grow on those platforms, and it's very much appreciated. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, this show continues because viewers like you send in their stories. I'd love to see your story at swampdweller.net or r slash thedarkswamp on Reddit. I'm always looking for scary stories of all kinds. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. I know, it's probably going to be a tough one to pick this time. They were all so good. If you made it to the very end, I'd love to see you comment the code word down in the comments down below. Jolly Christmas. It lets me know how many of you make it to the end, and it just confuses people, and it's a good laugh sometimes to see people questioning why everybody's saying some random sentence. Don't forget to join me over on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all the other good social medias, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.